The next segment of our nephron that we're going to focus on is called the distal convoluted tubule or simply DCT. Now, if we take a look at our nephron, we see that the distal convoluted tubule is located within this section of the nephron. So convoluted simply means it makes many twists and turns and distal means it's located relatively far from our renal corpuscle. Now, notice that the distal convoluted tubule connects the thick ascending loop of Henle to our collecting duct. And just like the proximal convoluted tubule, this section here lies within the renal cortex of the kidney, the distal convoluted tubule also is located within the renal cortex of the kidney. So the renal cortex is simply the outer portion of our kidney. Now, if we zoom in on the distal convoluted tubule, we basically get the following diagram. So this is a cross section of our distal convoluted tubule. So this inside portion, the cavity, is the lumen of our distal convoluted tubule. Everything outside the distal convoluted tubule is our surrounding tissue, also known as the interstitium. And these are the cells that are found that line the distal convoluted tubule. So we have two types of cells that we should be familiar with that are found inside the distal convoluted tubule. So let's begin with these cells shown in purple. So if we examine this diagram here, we see that our distal convoluted tubule, this section of our distal convoluted tubule is actually found in close proximity to our glomerulus. And these cells found within close proximity are shown in purple. So we essentially have our afferent arterial running along this location and it empties out into the glomerulus, which is located right here. And these purple cells are known as the macula densa. Now recall that the macula densa are part of the juxtaglomeral apparatus, the structure found in the nephron that regulates and controls the functionality of the nephron. So the question is, what exactly is the purpose of these purple cells, the macula densa cells? Well, they serve two important functions. Firstly, they can actually sense any fluctuation in sodium chloride concentration inside the lumen inside our distal convoluted tubule. And if the sodium chloride concentration inside the tubule drops, then what the macula uh, densa cells do is they are capable of stimulating the afferent arterial, this blood vessel right here, to actually dilate and increase in diameter diameter and that not only decreases the resistance of the blood flow but it also increases the amount of blood that reaches our glomerulus and that increases the hydrostatic pressure in our glomerulus and this controls or regulates the filtration rate inside our glomerulus also known as the glomerular filtration rate so function number one of macula densa cells is to regulate the filtration rate within the nephron. Now, the second, function, uh, the second function of macula densa cells is to stimulate the release of certain types of molecules that go on to stimulate the other cells in the juxtaglomerular apparatus known as our granule cells. It stimulates the granule cells to release renin, and renin is the proteolytic enzyme that is responsible for controlling the renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway, which regulates uh, regulates our blood pressure in the body. So these are the two functions of the macula densa cells. They essentially control the release of renin and they also control the dilation of our afferent arterial, thereby controlling the filtration rate within our glomerulus. Now, the other cells, basically shown in brown, are our epithelial cells and these are cuboidal epithelial cells. Now, the major difference between the epithelial cells in the distal convoluted tubule and the epithelial cells in the proximal convoluted tubule is the following.
In the proximal convoluted tubule, our epithelial cells contain microvilli, and this increases the reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule while in our distal convoluted tubule, we don't have the microvilli on the cuboidal epithelial cells. And that's exactly why reabsorption takes place at a much lower rate inside the distal convoluted tubule than inside our proximal convoluted tubule. In fact, most of the absorption in our uh, nephron takes place within the distal convoluted tubule and only about about 5% of sodium and chloride is actually absorbed within the distal convolute tubule as we'll see in just a moment. So the question is, so we know that absorption and secretion takes place within the distal convoluted tubule, but what exactly is absorbed and what exactly is secreted and how do these processes take place? So they occur as a result of the different types of protein transporters that are found on the membrane of these epithelial cells. So let's discuss these different types of protein transporters found along our membrane of the cuboidal epithelial cells found in the distal convoluted tubule. The first type of protein transport that we have to discuss is called NAK, so sodium potassium ATPase pump. And this is a pump, meaning it actually uses active transport. It utilizes an ATP molecule to establish an electrochemical gradient. So let's zoom in on this small cross section of our distal convoluted tubule. We get the following diagram. So this is the inside the lumen of our distal convoluted tubule. This is this section here. And this side of the cell is the apical side. So that means the other side, this side that points towards the interstitium is our basolateral side. It points towards the basement membrane. Now on the basolateral side, we have this ATPase pump and what it does is it uses a single ATP to move three sodium ions against its electrochemical gradient towards the outside of the cell, towards the interstitium. At the same time, it moves two potassium into the cell. And what this protein pump does is it establishes an electrochemical gradient in which we have a higher concentration of sodium on the lumen side than inside our cell. Now, why is this important? Important. Well, it's important because it allows the function of other proteins found within our cells, as we'll see in just a moment. So let's move on to the second type of protein known as the potassium, um, the sodium chloride co-transporter protein. This is this protein here. So this protein actually functions as a result of the ATPase pump. Because the ATPase pump is able to establish this electrochemical gradient in which we have more sodium on the lumen side, this NaCl co-transporter protein allows the movement of, pot of uh, sodium down its electrochemical gradient from the lumen side to the inside of the cell. At the same time, it also also moves a chloride along with the sodium. So we see that we have the reabsorption of chloride and sodium taking place and we basically move these ions into the interstitium, the surrounding tissue of our uh, distal convoluted tubule and these are eventually reabsorbed by the peritubular cavities found within and around our nephron. Now, the next type of protein channel that, uh, that we have to consider is the calcium channel. So the calcium channel, just like this protein, is found on the apical side, on the side that points towards our lumen. And this allows the reabsorption, the movement of calcium from the lumen into the cell and eventually into our interstitium. So we see that the three things that are reabsorbed inside the distal convoluted 
tubule is calcium, it's chloride, and it's sodium. Now, on the basolateral side of the membrane, we also have our sodium uh, calcium co-transporter protein, and this allows the movement of calcium from within the cell to our interstitium. And what this does is it allows our distal convolute tubule to reabsorb our calcium into the surrounding tissue and eventually into the peritubular cavities, our blood system. Now, you should note that a type of hormone known as the parathyroid hormone stimulates the reabsorption of calcium within our distal convoluted tubule. Now, let's move on to another type, or actually two sets of important channels known as the sodium potassium protein channels and sodium hydrogen uh, channels. So these two protein transporters are basically stimulated by a hormone known as aldosterone. So aldosterone can activate these channels. So this should be activate. It can activate these channels and this allows the reabsorption of sodium into the cell and the secretion of potassium into our lumen. So essentially, if this is our cell, this is the lumen side, the interstitium side, our Aldest, uh, our aldosterone can act on the distal convoluted tubule. It can activate this protein here, which basically even further reabsorbs the sodium from the lumen at the same time it dumps potassium into our lumen. And it also stimulates a second type of protein known as the sodium hydrogen protein that also reabsorbs our sodium and releases our hydrogen into our lumen. So we can summarize the function of the distal convoluted tubule in the following table. So we absorb about 5% of the sodium and chloride that is found in our filtrate. Notice this is much less than what is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. In the proximal convoluted tubule, we reabsorb about two thirds, about 65% of potassium and chloride, while in in the distal convoluted tubule, we only reabsorb about 5%. Now, we also reabsorb calcium, and notice that we also reabsorb water. In fact, the antidiuretic hormone, ADH, can actually act on the final section of the distal convoluted tubule to basically activate special types of protein channels to reabsorb water from the lumen and into our interstitium. Now we also see that as a result of our hormone known as aldosterone, we can basically increase the reabsorption of sodium as well as chloride, but at the same time, we increase the amount of potassium and hydrogen that we secrete into our filtrate that is found within the lumen of our distal convoluted tubule. So we see that the distal convoluted tubule basically acts as a fine-tuning mechanism. It fine-tunes, it reabsorbs a slight amount of sodium and chloride, about 5%, as well as a small portion of the water, as well as our calcium. So aldosterone, the antidiuretic hormone, and the parathyroid hormone can all act on the distal convoluted convoluted tubule to affect the amount of solute that is absorbed by that tubule.